Hi, welcome to Board Gems, my regular video series in which I cover older board game gems. And you know what? A lot of times I cover older, kind of forgotten games. Not this time. I do like to cover games that are not necessarily always regarded as the bang-on classics that they are. And you know what, the hobby moves on, there's the new hotness, and everybody's talking about that, and people think like, well that's old and busted, let's look at the new hotness. Don't ever forget about Medici, okay? This is an absolute gem of a game. It was designed by Reiner Knizia, it was published originally by Amigo in Germany in the 90s, I want to say like 95, 96, something like that. It is considered to be part of Knizia's auction trilogy, which is kind of a dumb thing. So there are three auction games that Reiner Knizia, the designer, is most known for that became absolute classics basically as soon as they came out. The first was Modern Art, which was early 90s, and then Medici in the mid 90s, and then later on there was Raw uh, in the late 90s. But Knizia does a lot of auction games. He's done High Society. He's done a game I've covered previously called, um, well, it goes by a bunch of different names, Hollywood, Hollywood Blockbuster, Dream Factory slash Trump Fabrique. The most recent version is called Nightmare Productions. And sometimes people will put those in and out of the trilogy. It's not really a trilogy. The three games of the trilogy come from three different publishers. It's just Knizia does auctions and does auctions well. So this time we're talking about Medici. Now this originally came out 95 by Amigo. Its English releases have been kind of all over the place. All the English publications are here beside me. So this is the first one that Rio Grande did. Now Rio Grande is most famous, not now, but they, they really got their start doing co-productions. They would go to a publisher, a German publisher, and say, what are some of your games that are coming out soon? Because we will pay you money now, and you make an extra thousand or two thousand copies for us to release in English. It worked out very well for a lot of German publishers, it allowed them to make more games, and so they get a, a price break. Nowadays, they don't do that as much. They do kind of originals or, or reprints, but their own productions anyway. And very early on, they wanted to bring in some of those classics that were already out in Germany. So they couldn't really do a co-production, right? It was already produced. It was already done. That was the case with uh, the Amigo edition from 95. So this edition here is Rio Grande trying to make their own version of Medici. And there's a companion video to this. Uh, the side-by-side -side comparison of these three editions. Have a look at this. It's quite something to see. When was this? This would have been 2006, I think. They and or Abacus, anyway, it was a joint thing that they did, that they produced an English slash German edition of Medici. So it would be uh, distributed in Germany by Abacus, distributed in English markets by Rio Grande. That's this version here. And finally, this one, this is from Grail Games down in Australia. Um, they recently had a falling out with Reiner Knizia. They had a couple of other Knizia games, and they don't have the rights to those anymore. So this edition, the Grail Games edition, which probably a lot of people are going to think is like the best edition, because it's, the art is like, oh my god, art! So people are going to be wanting this edition. Um, so this is probably going to get a little bit hard to find. Uh, if not already hard to find. This was from 2016. It's for three to six players. This edition has rules for two players. I wouldn't bother. My favorite number is probably five. Uh, three was a big disappointment when I played it. So I would say at least four players to play Medici. Ages 10 and up, I think. That's fair. Takes about an hour. Again, that's fair. It's an auction game. And it's one of those auction games that has really simple rules but it's very challenging to do well because how well you do doesn't just depend on your grasp of the rules, doesn't just depend on your strategy. It, of course, depends on the other players. Very, very interactive game like any pure auction games are. It can be a little intimidating because 
it's a once around auction. And I'm a fan of once around auctions. They're auctions that move at a good pace. A lot of regular auctions are super slow, you know, where, you know, me and Joe are, are outbidding each other by one every time. And there's Carol on the side just waiting for her turn. Who knows how long this is going to go on. Once around, really snappy, really punchy. This takes about an hour, sometimes a touch longer, but you don't feel like the game is dragging it on. You are involved the whole time. Let me show you how it plays. Then afterwards, I will explain to you in great detail why it's still a gem. No question. Is it a gem? Pfft. It is. Spoiler alert. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. Give each player a player aid, double-sided, which shows the scoring. One ship board, which has five spaces for goods or cards. And all six pieces of a single color. One of them will start on the outside ring of each of the five tracks. And one will go on to the track. Now the track is for victory points and it's also for money. I'm going to set it up for a five player game, which each player starts with 30. This is victory points, but it's also money. The player with the most money at the end of the game wins. This version also has a round marker. You see the floor de lis show the round it's in. So round three, round two, round one. You're going to take the deck of cards, shuffle them, and take out a number of cards depending on the number of players. You do this each round. In a six player game, you'll use all the cards, but for five or fewer, you're going to take some out. Each card is one of the five different types and has a value between zero and five. In fact, I think it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, and five. So there's two fives and there is one of every other value. There is also a gold card, one single gold card, which has a value of 10, but no suit. It doesn't represent any particular good. So at the start of every round, take all the cards, shuffle them together, and then remove a number based on the player count. And you're ready to begin the round. The game takes place over three rounds. Each round, you are trying to fill up your boat. At the end of the round, players are going to get money slash points based on how valuable their ship is, their, how valuable their cargo is. The most valuable cargo hold will score 30 points, and then the second most will score 20, so on. In addition to that, players will also be moving up on these tracks. For every card of a type of good they have in their hold, they will get to move up one space on the corresponding track. At the end of every round, the player who is the highest in a track will score a bonus 10 points slash money and second place will score five. At the end of the round, you will empty out your cargo holds, but your progress on these tracks will stay. And so in the second and third round, there will be particular goods that you want to collect because they will get you up higher and higher. You will see that the highest spaces on the track have bonuses. And these bonuses are given to every player who can make it up this far on the track. So it behooves you to try to get your markers as far up the tracks as possible. Of course, you won't be able to do that for all the tracks. Play is clockwise. On a player's turn, they're going to flip over one to three cards from the deck. They get to flip over the first one, look at it, decide if they want to add a second. And again, after looking at the second, decide if they want to add a third. Maybe they want to stop there. I'll stop. Just So this is a lot of two goods cards that players will now be bidding for. It is a once around auction, starting with the player to the left, the player whose turn it is, the player who drew these, the player to their left calls out a single bid. It's once around, you won't get a chance to raise the bid later. You are of course limited to how much money you have recorded on this board. So that first player to the left of the current player either must make a single bid or pass. The next player 
may also pass, or they can make a bid that's higher than any previous bid, and so on, going around the table once. When it comes back around to the player whose turn it is, there will be one, often one outstanding bid, and then the current player decides whether they want to beat that bid and buy the goods for that amount, or pass and let the player who bid the highest take it. So in other words, let's say I put up this lot, and after it went around the table, the highest bid, which was from Joan, was for six. That was the highest bid, and now it's come back around to me. I can let Joan have it for six, or I can buy it for seven. And nobody can outbid my seven. I am the last person to choose. If I choose to pay the seven, I will move seven spaces back on this track, and I will take these cards, and I will place them in my hold. There's only room for five cards. Now what that can mean is that later on, let's say I have three cards in my hold, it's another player's turn, they're flipping over cards, one, two, oh, let's add a third one. I cannot bid on that because I don't have room in my hold for it. If nobody wants the lot, if nobody bids on it, we say it gets thrown overboard <laughs> into the sea and the cards go away. There's only a limited number of cards in this deck. So it can happen if enough goods are not purchased, they're just thrown overboard as we say, then it's possible that not everybody will be able to fill their ship. When only one player has room left on their ship, they get to draw from the deck cards for free, but they don't get any choice in what they are. When the deck runs out and we have a chance to bid on those last cards, or once all players have filled up their holds, then it's the end of the round. And each player sums up the value of the goods in their hold. Mine is eight, that's pretty bad. You'll have a look at the player aid, which will show point values based on the number of players. The player with the most valuable hold will get the highest number. Second most valuable hold, second highest number, and so on. This is free money, you move forward on the track here. If there's a tie, then you combine them and split the difference. After that's done, then we look at our hold and the types of goods that are in there. And for each type of good you have in your hold, you move forward one space on the matching track. So for this ship, I'll move forward one space on the purple track, one space on the gray track, and three spaces on this orange track. After all the players have done that, then we look and see who is the furthest ahead. The player who is furthest ahead on each of the five tracks will score a bonus 10 points, and second place in a three to six player game will get five points. And again, the points are shared in the case of a tie. And that's one round. All the players give up their goods on their ship. Be sure to add back in any cards that you've set aside from the previous round. Shuffle up the deck. Progress on these tracks. Stay where it is. So now I'm very interested in getting more orange because it allows me to get these bonuses. If I'm here, then I'm going to score whatever points I get for being first or second, or not, or neither. But regardless of what place I'm in, I'm also going to get an additional five. So it can, of course, be very good to get up here. That's worth quite a bit. The player who has the least amount of money will go first in the second round. And you play three rounds. And the player with the most money slash points at the end of the third round wins the game. That's it. You're ready to play Medici. This is the way games should be. And, you know, there are still games made this way, but it's a style of game that has definitely fallen out of favor. The best games... Now, of course, everything is subjective. Don't get angry at me. How can you not understand that some people would want something different? I understand, but I'm still going to justify my opinion to you, if that's okay. The best games, in my opinion, 
are games with simple rules, but have a complexity to them not, not from the rules, not navigating the rules, trying to solve a puzzle, trying to figure out how you can get 18 victory points instead of 16. No, the complexity comes from the other players interacting with them and adjusting your tactics on the fly based on what's happening around the table. You want the game to be with your fellow players. So often nowadays, the game is something independent from the other players. You're playing the game and it doesn't matter with whom you are playing because all the focus is on the game mechanisms and the other players just basically end up like randomizers. Oh, I was hoping to get that thing, but somebody took it. Who took it? Doesn't matter. No, the game is up front. Here are the rules. I'm giving you everything at the beginning of the game, everything you need to win. The rules are there. There is enough information given to you while being taught to win your very first game. But it's an auction game. And in the end, what matters is how well you do against the other players, which is how a game should be. Of Reiner Knizia's most famous auction games, this one might be the most intimidating purely because it's a once around auction. There is no give, there is no forgiveness. There is no time to get better at the game in a once around auction. Your turn comes around, you need to put out a bid, one bid, factoring in everything else that's going around the table. You're factoring in how much do I want this thing? Maybe not much. But I see this player to my left really, really wants it. So if I bid low, they're going to get a deal. If I bid high, they're going to let me have it and I don't really want it. So I want to thread that needle. I want to make a bid low enough that I don't feel super, 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 super bad if I have to take it because I got a deal on it. But it's just expensive enough that it makes my opponent, the next player in turn order, have to think a little bit. And when you hear them sigh or groan, you know you did well. <laughs> when you gave them a challenging decision to make, oh, that's like the perfect bid. I, that's what I was going to bid. I don't, do I bid higher? That's more than I'm willing to pay for it. But should I let you have it? You don't want it. So I'd be kind of sabotaging you if I made you take it. But I really want it. <laughs> and those sorts of moments are fun. But it can be intimidating because if you're a starting player, like this is your first time playing, maybe you feel like you can't get there right away. Medici is a simple game. And I don't want any reputation I actually don't know if it has a reputation as being unforgiving, but once around auctions tend to feel that way in my experience. I don't want anybody to get the vibe that because it's a once around auction and it can be intimidating, it can be uh, challenging for a player new to the game to kind of evaluate things, that it keeps them away from trying it. You want a game in which you can get better over multiple plays, okay? Nobody's expecting you to beat a grandmaster at chess on your first game, right? What do you do in chess? You play with people of comparable skill level. And in that way, or maybe people who are just a little bit better than you. And in that way, you get better. The first game maybe is a bit of a learning game. Just to get a feel for how things are valued, you can get a feel for all the factors that you need to, well, factor into your decision-making process. But honestly, it's a three round game. After round one, you're gonna get the hang of it, okay? And rounds two and three is where it gets interesting. Because you see, there's two main scoring ways and they pull people in different directions, which is which is great. Like you, it's important in an auction game for things to be have different values to different players because that makes the valuations interesting. So in rounds two and three, which we'll get to, th that definitely comes into play. In the first round though, generally speaking, people want to have a valuable ship. 
that's where the bulk of the points are going to come in that first round is who has the most valuable ship they're getting like 30 points it's a huge number of points or money whatever they're the same in this game isn't that refreshing victory points aren't some abstract thing here's some money have the most money at the end that's the goal actually this more games should do that the two main things that you're scoring every round is the value of your ship the player with the most valuable ship the highest values on their ship is going to get many more points than the person who has the least but you're also trying to get in the lead in the some of the five different goods so you also want to focus and in the round one nobody's anywhere so there's no focus so in that first round generally speaking everybody tries to go for a really valuable ship and maybe the first time you play that first round you don't really get that and you end up with the fifth most valuable ship and okay you don't get many points and you learn something in that first round the game's not over after that first round in that first round or two you are building the strength of your presence in certain goods and if you can get at the top of any of those tracks that is a huge benefit in practice what happens is first round people just generally try to go for as valuable a ship as possible then they advance on some tracks and then they see for the next rounds what they want to focus on if you're teaching the game i haven't tried this myself but you could teach the game in such a way where you go you know what this first round that's coming up don't worry about that track stuff right now just focus on getting a valuable ship get high numbers in your ship and that gets them used to kind of a one-dimensional auction where they're focused on one thing a little bit more approachable but then as they enter the second round and of course especially the third round they start to see how important the other half of the game is and they can grow not just over multiple games they can grow in over the course of just one game you know start off with a, a smaller focus and then they can see by the second round that the focus is changing a little bit or there's an additional factor that you need to start considering and you really feel growth over this three round arc i really don't want anybody to feel intimidated by this game uh, obviously you do want to if you can play this type of game with people of similar skill levels if you're going into a four or five player game say and everybody is at the same footing nobody has played it before including you then you can just fly by the seat of your pants and have fun and in the end somebody wins but who cares but you learn something and then if the same group plays again you're going to learn something more you're all going to get better and introduce more challenge to each other of course if you enter a game with somebody saying medici is my favorite game i've played this 30 times probably if not more and this is your first time going in you can expect to lose and that shouldn't be a reason not to play right but you should be able to see a glimpse of the beauty of the elegance which is kind of a dirty word now apparently but but it is absolutely true there are not many perfect games all right but i would argue medici is one of them a good auction game needs two things the first you need things to be worth different things to different players and in the first round of medici that's not so much the case nobody's focusing on those um tracks so much right maybe they're keeping a, a you know back of their mind they're thinking about that but the most important thing in the first round is is getting a valuable boat but over the course of the round different things will be worth different amounts to different players but you also want to make it relatively easy to evaluate especially in a once around auction where you only have one chance i mean be patient with players in this game if they think about it for a while let them it's not a fly by the seat of your pants sort of game necessarily it can be played that way with all new players just you know throw out whatever bid you want it all kind of self-balances in my experience but it definitely rewards thinking a little bit so if you're with a player who wants to you know take their time and think about what to bid you know give them a break don't be like come on let's go i hate players like that i read something somewhere that players don't want to look dumb 
I mean, in general, people don't want to look dumb. I don't think that's a controversial point. I think that's pretty normal. Nobody wants to look dumb in front of other people. But what's new to me is the observation, the realization that a lot of people don't want thinky, interactive board games because of the fear that they will make a bad move and because it's interactive, like an auction, say, everyone will see that it's a bad move. Yeah, okay. If you are that type of player, you'll probably want to avoid Medici, I guess. If you throw out a bid of 40 and people are like, you, know, you can have it for 40, right? And then you're looking at it as like, why did I spend 40 for this, right? And you feel dumb. This is not a problem with the game. It's a problem with the players. You want to play with people uh, with whom you enjoy their company uh, that will not berate you <laughs> for making a bad play. I, I, like, I get it. You know, if, if you're just working on your own solitary puzzle and then in the end, you know, you have 160 points, but the winner has 182 People will be like, yeah, you lost, but they're not going to be like, and here's why you lost. It was this really dumb move you made one third of the way through the game. No, nobody's paying attention to what anybody else is doing. So I guess I can see that. I'm just saying it makes for a very solitary experience, and that's not fun. If you want to play a solitary game, play a solitary game. Play a game just by yourself. And then when you're with other people, do something interactive in which you can enjoy their company and be present at the game or at whatever activity with them. Look them in the eyes. Talk to them to the face. And this is something I usually don't put almost any weight or thought into, is what's called the left-right binding, which is the idea that in a game in which play is, you know, say, clockwise around the table, who sits next to whom it becomes extremely important. And Medici is one of those games. If you had a five-player game, say, and one player was a friggin' rock star at this game, just won all the time, and one player was, like, super, super new and hadn't even heard of the game before and was not really sure about this meaty chi thing, but whatever, we'll give it a try. And if that new player sits to the right of the rock star, super amazing Medici player, yeah, that's going to have... An effect on the whole game because the new player is not going to be able to evaluate something properly they'll make a mistake and then the experienced player is going to take advantage of that if you're playing in a tournament setting maybe you want to put the extra work into the seating arrangement compared to positions in a tournament or something i don't know about you but i play board games for fun so I don't worry about that. If I'm a new player and I'm sitting down at a table and I know that at least one other player is experienced, I'm expecting to lose. I don't find that to be a problem. If you're worried about being one of the other players, just seeing somebody run away with the game and not feeling like you can do anything about it, like, okay, I guess you can try to fiddle with the seating arrangements a bit. Everything in this game comes together. Like even at the end of the round, there's a push your luck aspect, right? And you see this sort of thing in Raw as well. There's always going to be like one player at the end of the round who doesn't have a full ship. Everybody else's ships are full. So there's one player left and they can get goods for free, which is great, but maybe it's not what they want. They don't have a choice. Whatever they draw, that's what they're getting. Right. And there's a bit of excitement there. Like they got exactly what they needed. They took a chance. Right. Bidding low on everything during the round. Waited until the end and try to get lucky. And you can count that a little bit because information on like the composition of the deck, that's completely open. And when you're playing with fewer than six players, some cards are taken out. With a full six players, all the cards are in play. So during the course of the round, you can look and see what cards have come out. Like I like to count the fives, right? How many fives have come out? There's two fives for each one of the five suits. But if, I see there are five still to come, I'm encouraged to bid a little bit lower. Even if I don't win things, those fives might come out later. And if I happen to be the last person with space on their ship and I'm getting goods for free, maybe I'm getting those fives. But there's a risk too, because during the round, if nobody wants to bid on a lot, let's say people draw cards and it's all zeros and ones, 
And people are like, well, I don't really want that. And they bid zero. Everybody bids zero. We usually say the goods get tossed, get dumped into the ocean. <laughs> but if that happens enough times, then anybody who wants to wait late to pick up free goods, well, there might not be enough goods left over for them to do that. Lots of simple, simple to explain, but decisions that affect literally everything you do. But it is for that reason that I probably prefer to play this with five at, at the best count. So three is really underwhelming. I do not recommend this game with three. Four is completely fine. Five is best, but five is the highest count in which you do remove some cards. So there isn't perfect information. The game works completely well with six, and there honestly aren't that many great, thinky, not too long games that play well with six. So Medici is one of those. I wouldn't say it's at its best with six only because all cards are in play. So there is more potential to card count, but it's not a big deal. With six, it's great. And there's so little choice for a game that plays well with six players that is simple to learn, but thinky, presents a challenge to the players and doesn't take all that long to play in our tops. For this reason, Medici is an absolutely great game. It fits that um, pigeonhole beautifully. This is the way the game should be. Simple rules that melt away. You're left with the interaction with the other players. You can react to what other players are doing. If a player bids high, you can go, oh, right? And you feel involved in everything. And every round, there's going to be a once-around auction, and you can be involved in that. So there isn't a lot of downtime. Like I said, simple rules that melt away. You're just left with a player interaction. Game doesn't take all that long. Plays up to six really well. In some ways, it's the perfect board game. Seriously. However, there is no perfect version of the game. <laughs> so there have been many attempts to produce this game, and they all have their own idiosyncrasies. The first one, German edition, Amigo, is completely fine. I mean, it's going to look like a 1995 game, but there's nothing overly wrong with the presentation. This version, which also came out in the mid-90s, but after Amigo, this is the Rio Grande trying it on their own. Whew. I bet you could probably find this one for cheap, and it will play fine. But it's really ugly. At least the board is really ugly. Well, if you have a chance, check out the side-by-side -side comparison of these three editions. <laughs> this is my favorite, actually. Now, this is the one that most people are going to like. But this is my favorite. It's in a small box. This is Carcassonne-sized. And one thing is, in most editions, you use cards to denote the goods and cards are drawn and they're put on your boat. It does mean that you have to pass a deck of cards around. And for me, it's much more natural to draw tiles. And this version, yes, <laughs> this version, the, the, the top one, I guess, uh, that one is the only one that I know of that uses tiles. I think all the other ones I'm familiar with use cards. And I prefer tiles because it's just natural to pass a, a bag of tiles around. I mean, the board is a little bit small since, it, I mean, any game that can play up to six players, you want to have like a big board so everybody can see what's going on. But honestly, for Medici, it's not that big a deal. Um, it's just tracking, it's pieces on tracks on boards. You, usually you don't have to be super close to see what's going on. The colors are rather pastel. And in the mid 2000s, this was quite normal because, you know, before the mid 2000s, the big thing was beige, right? <laughs> so many board games were beige and people love to complain about that. But there's a reason games were beige. It was so that the colors, the player colors stand out. So you wanted a neutral kind of color as the background. So the primary colors, which were the player colors, pop. Here's where they started to go away from that a little bit to have more color in their games, but they kept the colors rather pastel. So there's a pink, but it's a faint pink. There's a green, but it's a faint green. And I find the colors do still 
differentiate from each other very, very well. So the player pieces are only differentiated by color, so it might be a problem for colorblind players. And the numbers on the tiles don't really stand out very well. So I think most people would probably agree the Grail edition is the best. It certainly has lovely art. The colors are really, really bright, um, oversaturated. Perfect? Mm, still no, because it goes back to cards, which I prefer less. This is the most attractive version. It has two player rules, uh, which are, I have not tried them myself. Um, I have Medici versus Strozzi, which is a fantastic game. And I don't need a weaker two player version of Medici when I have that. Especially if anybody in your group is colorblind or has difficulty differentiating colors, or even if you're just playing games in low light. Um, this is again, probably still the best version, but this is going to be, if you're interested in Medici and you want this edition, get it soon because they are not going to reprint this edition. There will probably be another version of Medici someday. I'm not sure when, uh, and maybe that one will be perfect. But until then, this is probably the best one for most people. And if you're thinking of getting it, get it soon. It's not gonna get any cheaper. I'm probably going to sell mine of this. I'm gonna stick with this because I prefer the tiles. You can find flaws with every single version of Medici out there, but don't let it put you off. Uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, and it is good to have this game in your collection, any edition. Thanks for watching. Remember, older gems like Medici don't stop being good just because newer games come out, okay? Take care.